No ceasefire in Gaza since the month of November. And just as it's subsiding a little, growing fears now over Lebanon. We'll ask, uh, with the latest border incidents, uh, whether initial fears of an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah could still prove true. In hindsight, Iran's first-ever direct missile attacks on Israel back in April still seemed like it was a symbolic gesture so far. But it's got Benjamin Netanyahu's top brass's attention, top brass that's at loggerheads with the PM over the lack of an exit strategy in Gaza. The prime minister, who's managed in recent weeks, it seems, to steady his political ship, despite foreign and domestic pressure, uh, to the point uh, where he can do without the opposition in a unity war cabinet, and uh, on Monday dissolving said cabinet, staring down his own far-right coalition partners. But for how long? And how long can the rest of the world feel the spillover? Take here in France, where eight months of uh, a war in the Middle East have strained political alliances to the point where divisions could prove a factor in crucial snap legislative elections where every vote counts. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Israel's two fronts. Joining us from Jerusalem, academic and uh, retired Israeli ambassador Jeremy uh, Isakarov. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Thank you for inviting me. From London, former peace negotiator Nomi Bar Yaakov, associate fellow at the Chatham House Think Tank's International Security Program. Good to see you. Good to see you, Francois. From Washington, Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure, Francois. Thank you. And Nadim Houri, executive director of the Arab Reform Initiative Think Tank. How have you been? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, fighting in central Gaza this Tuesday still going on, despite what the Israeli military calls daily tactical pauses. Overall, there less fighting as Muslims mark the Eid al hadha festival. Once again, though, there's growing concern over tensions at the Lebanese border. These images, handouts from Israel's military, they follow Monday's killing of a Hezbollah militant. Last week, the deadly strike against a senior commander of that uh, Iran-backed militant group sparked a huge volley of rockets fired into Israel. For its part, Hezbollah announcing a fresh drone attack against an Israeli tank while releasing footage purportedly from a surveillance drone above uh, the northern Israeli uh, city of uh, Haifa. And it's all happening amid shuttle diplomacy. Joe Biden's Middle East envoy uh, sat down with uh, Israeli leaders on Monday, Amos Hochstein, who's since traveled on to Beirut. Uh, we can show you uh, images with the uh, uh, Hezbollah-aligned speaker of Lebanon's uh, parliament, Nabi Berry. Hochstein, who's calling for cooler heads to prevail. I had an excellent discussion with the prime minister. We always have good discussions. This is a serious time and a critical moment. Uh, there's what we are working together is to try to identify a way to, to get to a place where we prevent a further escalation, as I gave in my previous statements. Hussein Ibish, this has been a, a, a huge concern for Washington ever since October 7th. What do you make of this, this shuttle diplomacy there by the Americans? Um, I would... Nadim Hori, excuse me. No, no, it's, uh, it's totally fine. Look, I think the Americans, uh, like the French at the G7 last week, but frankly, since the last few months, have made it very clear they don't want to see a war between Israel and Hezbollah because they know that such a war would bring in the Iranians, would endanger uh, U.S. interests in Iraq, in Syria, uh, and actually probably destabilize world economy because Iran would probably not sit out a full fight between Israel and Hezbollah. So the U.S., every time the heat goes up, you see uh, Amos Hochstein uh, starting visiting the area. I think this is probably his fourth or fifth visit in the, since uh, October 7th. So when he's in town, you know there's trouble? Well, I think they're, they're trying to play firefighter at this point, trying to calm tensions, trying to keep channels open uh, and so forth. Everyone, I mean, it seems everyone says no one wants the war, but miscalculations could happen. Um, and I think the problem is with, with everyone playing with fire so closely, there's a real risk that someone could miscalculate and one miscalculation could set not just Lebanon and Israel on fire, frankly, the entire region. Uh, Jeremy Isakarov, just... Uh, explain for our viewers why we're seeing the, these repeated spikes uh, at the border between uh, Israel and Lebanon. 
Well, actually, over the last couple of days uh, during the Muslim uh, uh, festival of Eid al Adha, uh, the northern border actually quietened down a bit after uh, a period of uh, continuous barrages from the north, from, Hez from Hezbollah in Lebanon, and also reactions from the Israeli side. Um, it, it's difficult at this point. One could only hope that uh, Amos Hochstein's uh, efforts could bring some sort of stabilization. But I think a lot of what's happening in the north is tied to what is happening in, uh, in Gaza as well. Uh, and the course of the fighting in Gaza and the, the attack by Hamas on Israel on October 7th was essentially what sparked the instability in the north and the fact that our northern settlements and villages were, were shelled and we had to evacuate them. And still, there are tens of thousands of Israelis who are displaced from their homes in the north. So this is a very complicated situation. Your previous speaker was right. We're not looking to escalate the situation, but miscalculations can happen. And I think we need to do every effort in order to bring uh, some sort of stability to that, uh, that area. So, Nomi Baryakov, let me put it to you then. Uh, we've had in the last couple of hours uh, strong words from Israel's foreign minister, uh, warning he's ready to take on, uh, uh, Israel's ready to take on uh, Hezbollah if need be with, quote, total war. W what's the calculus, especially with the killing of this senior commander last week? I think that's the danger that the previous two speakers are speaking about, are the miscalculations. I mean, rhetoric, rhetoric can be very dangerous. And in this case, the continuous warning of an all-out war in Lebanon and the destruction of Beirut um, could uh, be construed as a real threat as opposed to a verbal threat. And uh, the reaction from Hezbollah could be one that um, Israel isn't envisaging. So I think it was a very, very, very um, difficult and a pivotal uh, moment uh, where um, one needs to watch not only actions, but also words. I think it is true, like Jeremy said, we do not, I don't think either side wants an all-out war, but the key to resolving uh, the northern border is Gaza. Um, we saw in November, for example, during the ceasefire period where um, that lasted around a week, that there was um, Hezbollah stopped attacking or the, in Israel. So we had a one week of a lull and it was the only week since the 7th of October was when there was a ceasefire in Gaza. So all eyes on Gaza. And I think that's um, what um, Amos Hochstein is trying to do. He's trying to make sure that there's no escalation in Lebanon. Um, and trying to resolve Gaza at the same time. So which leg of the trip is more important, Hussein Nibish, the part where he was in Israel or the part where he goes to Lebanon? Probably the part in Lebanon. Uh, this is the main U.S. policy uh, towards the uh, Gaza war and the post-October 7 crisis. It's been a policy of conflict containment. I think Washington's biggest fear was that the war could spread uh, to involve Hezbollah and then drag in uh, Iran and ultimately drag in the United States. I don't agree with uh, my three colleagues here that nobody wants a war. I think it's very clear, even though Israel, I, I don't see any evidence that Israel has decided that uh, they want a war right now. There is a sort of working consensus in the Israeli government that a war with Hezbollah is inevitable. And there are at least two key figures, the Defense Minister Yav Galant and National Security Advisor Zahi Hanegbi, who have been pushing for a major uh, invasion of Lebanon or a major attack on Hezbollah since early October, since around October 11th or 12th. Uh, I think it's pretty clear the Biden administration has been the biggest single obstacle to that ambition. And I also think it's clear why. I've, I've explained this on your show since since October, that there are people in the Israeli government who feel that uh, there, there is a need for the Israeli public and for the Israeli state to have a big victory, a major win, and that that's not available in Gaza, so that they have to look north to Hezbollah, to a more conventional enemy, and an enemy that frankly poses a much bigger military threat to Israel, and in that way kind of turn a strategic crisis for Israel into a net victory. But of course, that assumes success, which is by no means assured. Um, so I do think there are hotheads in the region, and primarily uh, in 
part of the Israeli uh, now dissolved war cabinet. There are people who want a major war, and those are some people in Israel. And you named uh, one of them. Let's talk about him. In, uh, uh, or one main one, the uh, defense minister. He's in the crosshairs of France. France, uh, mm -hmm. a mediator alongside yeah. the U.S. when it comes to Lebanon. A court in Paris this Tuesday ordering organizers of a defense trade show to suspend a ban on Israeli firms, a ban ordered by the French government. That's according to organizers. It's not been confirmed by, uh, by the Macron government. Uh, the uh, Euro Satori trade show organized at fairgrounds near Charles de Gaulle Airport, north <laughs> of Paris. The ban had uh, sparked a vitriolic attack by Israel's defense minister, said Yoav Gallant. While we wage a just war to defend our fellow citizens, France adopts hostile policies towards the state of Israel, thus ignoring atrocities committed by Hamas. Uh, the foreign minister of Israel, uh, Israel Katz, uh, who hails from the same Likud party as Yoav Gallant, putting out a communique uh, saying the defense minister's words were, quote, incorrect and had no reason uh, to be. Uh, so differences aired in public uh, between yeah. the two. Jeremy uh, Isakarov, what's this all about? Well, first of all, I think, uh, I, you know, far be it from me to get uh, in between two, uh, two ministers, uh, Israeli ministers, but I would say this. I think this whole story started by this boycott of Israeli firms was entirely, um, you know, not called for unacceptable. And I think at this point in time when France could pursue a very positive role in bringing together a number of major policy issues that are important for us, like in Hezbollah, like the issue of Iran uh, in the IEA. Recently, France joined uh, the Great, Great Britain and, uh, and Germany in bringing about a resolution, and they've always been a major player in the P5 plus one. And I think that's what you're seeing. I think you're seeing a very stark reaction from the Minister of Defense, who is angry at this boycott of Israeli firms. There's obviously a great deal of sensitivity to that. And there was also the foreign minister sort of taking a broader view of what, you know, Israeli-French relations are and trying to sort of like find a balance between these two things. But I do understand that there was a French court today that actually reversed this uh, boycott. Yeah, it, it did uh, reverse it. Uh, but again, why, a, why is, why is Yoav Gallant uh, being so outspoken and why is Israel Katz contradicting him publicly? Well, because, no, I, I, look, I think it's, look, it's natural that two, the, uh, um, even ministers can see things in different ways. And I think, again, this boycott of Israeli firms was uncalled for and unacceptable in many ways and doesn't, you know, benefit the, the very close ties that we have between Israel and France. So I think there is legitimate anger on one side, but there's a, very much a desire by the foreign minister to sort of keep this crisis within, you know, within uh, a tolerable level and to contain it as much as possible in view of the broader picture, which we've already addressed. Nomi Baryakov, do you agree? I think I just like to, uh, slight, to slightly qualify. I think they're looking at this at the relationship with France through different lenses. I think Yoav Gallant is a minister of defense. He's a military man and he looks at things through that lens and that lens alone. And he's also, you know, taking a more aggressive stance in Gaza and a more aggressive stance towards Hezbollah in Lebanon. And Eli Cohen, give, being he, given that he's minister of foreign affairs, is looking at the diplomatic side. And he was horrified. And you're asking why this is done in public. It's done in public because the statements were made in public. Um, Gallant made his statements in public and therefore um, Eli Cohen felt he had no choice but to make a public statement uh, rebuking that and saying that this isn't the case. He also mentioned that France had helped um, fend off the Iranian attack in April of all the drones and the ballistic missiles and the cruise missiles. So France has played a very constructive role. And I think as someone, as I think Hussein Ibish said, the hot heads around, well, certainly Gallant is a hot head and Eli Cohen isn't. And I think you've got that sort of um, tension between the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Do you I'd think, do, like do, you, do you agree with, um, with uh, Hussein that there is a, a strong appetite for a prolonged fight on two fronts or to look for a win against Hezbollah? No, I'm afraid I don't. I, um, I don't. I beg to differ. I think that um, there is a sense that um, Hamas has to be crushed um, militarily and there were 
um, information today about exactly how many of the six battalions have been destroyed, how many have moved out. And, you know, they're really looking at this technically. These are the six Hamas battalions that remained in Rafa intact, um, which it was the logic for the Israeli army um, to go in. The other issue is um, that I don't think Itamar ben Gvir, who's been given an awful lot of uh, coverage in um, the foreign press, is the one making the decisions about the war. He's a minister of internal security. There's, right, there's, right. he's not, and he's not in the secure in the in the what was the war cabinet. And I think Netanyahu has made it very clear that he's not going to give him a role, despite his demands, in those decisions. So yes, he was very margin. He's a um, he was a marginal figure before Netanyahu decided to um, ally himself with the margins. Um, but now Netanyahu realizes that he can't allow those um, extreme fanatics like Ben Gvir to oh. dictate policy. They have no oh. understanding in um, foreign policy. It's not their um, realm of expertise. Uh, uh, Francois, can I clarify? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go just ahead. very just quickly, I'm, in a... I'm not saying that, that Israel has decided that or that it's now Israeli policy to seek a war. I'm saying that there are at least two important figures who've been pushing for it, and I think that Understood. they do want it. That's all I'm saying. J Jeremy so Isaacaroff. I qualify the difference. I think one of them is in the decision-making. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Hanegbi and Galant that I'm talking about, not Ben Gvir. Right. He's well, Negbi is, you know, national yeah. security advisor. Yeah. So, you I know, he so. does have more. He does. Yes, you said so. He does have more say than right. um, than the um, more extreme elements. Jeremy Isaacar, very briefly on this point. Yeah, I think you're by saying that somebody's looking for a big victory is really belittling the gravity of the situation in the north. Uh, you know, when we look at the situation after October 7th, when Israel was surprised and our borders were breached and a massive uh, security breach, you can't expect us not to look at Hezbollah, which is a far stronger force than Hamas, which has a great deal of coordination with Hamas, not to be concerned of the force that Hamas has amassed, the amount of missiles yep. that are aimed at Israel. And so there is a very major security dilemma. Do you wait yes. for them to use this force against you or do you preempt? So this is not just a matter of like looking for a big victory. This is a very major dilemma. Nadim Hori, well, yeah. but if we're going to talk that, about security, I mean, that's part of the problem uh, is why are we just talking about the security of Israel? I mean, you want to talk about exactly. the violations of 1701. You know, the Lebanese government counted 35,000 violations of 1701 since 2006. The UN Who occupied Council. southern Lebanon? How many people have been displaced? How many killed? There are actually 92 civilians killed on the Lebanese side, 11 civilians killed on the Israeli side. So as much as Israelis talk about their sense of insecurity in the north, actually, if anyone has been insecure for the last 30 years because of Israel, it's actually the inhabitants of Lebanon. You know, Excuse day me. in, day out. I mean, those of us who lived in Lebanon and, who, and those, who, those who live in southern Lebanon, they hear the drones. Everyone can tell you immediate stories of what they are. The irony in all of this is we all know what the settlement looks like. And it's Resolution 1701 applied okay. fairly to everyone. We right. saw that it's actually possible to get a deal. In 2022, you know, the U.S. managed to mediate, uh, uh, you know, the sea maritime border deal. And we all know what the issues are. The problem is, you know, there is no victory to be had against Hezbollah. Every time Israel has gone into Lebanon hoping to score some sort of victory, it's come back with actually a, strength, a strengthened Hezbollah. So the only way out is we go back to 1701. I mean, what I'm surprised with, to be honest, is there cannot be a war between Israel and Hezbollah if the U.S. does not green light it. Because Israel will need new arms. And the part, I mean, the problem, the weakness of the Biden administration is they should be making it very clear is we will not supply you the weapons you need to have this sustained war with, with Hezbollah. And we know Hezbollah is not going to escalate beyond continuing to sort of, you know, keep kind of poking at Israel to put pressure to have Gaza. So it's true. It's all eyes on Gaza. We, you know, there has to be a ceasefire in Gaza. So in the northern border, will go quiet. And by the way, since 2006, until October 7th, the border between Israel and Lebanon had never been as quiet as it had. And this was the quietest it had been in ever. Right. Well, I, Nadim is right, except on one point. Israel could go to war yeah, with I'm Hezbollah without a green light from the United States. It could then go 
uh, to work on the ground in Congress with its strong connections with evangelical Republicans and these radical fundamentalist Christians. Also, huge support among uh, traditional liberals and most Democrats in Congress. I think that they could make the calculation that in the end, the United States would be would be compelled uh, to support these uh, Israel, even if they're wrong. I, I don't think. And that, that, and they that brings us that brings us to line. Hussein. That brings us to an important news item from today, and that is the Israeli Prime Minister uh, taking to social media with a video clip to fight on two fronts. You need manpower. You need bullets. Enter Benjamin Netanyahu speaking in English as he tends to do when he's trying to address American audiences. When Secretary Blinken was recently here in Israel. We had a candid conversation. I said I deeply appreciated the support the U.S. has given Israel from the beginning of the war. But I also said something else. I said it's inconceivable that in the past few months, the administration has been withholding weapons and ammunition to Israel. Israel, America's closest ally, fighting for its life, fighting against Iran and our other common enemies. Secretary Blinken assured me that the administration is working day and night to remove these bottlenecks. I certainly hope that's the case. It should be the case. During World War II, Churchill told the United States, give us the tools, we'll do the job. And I say, give us the tools and we'll finish the job a lot faster. Uh, for more on that, let's cross uh, to Jerusalem and correspondent to uh, Iris Makler. Uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, uh, besides making the comparison with, uh, with Winston Churchill's uh, England, <laughs> Uh, what's it all about, this statement? Uh, I think it is about wanting um, ammunition for the fight ahead in Lebanon. I have heard it from a number of uh, military analysts that I've interviewed who say simply Israel cannot continue at this pace on two fronts. And in fact, they're not well armed enough for um, a fight in Lebanon. So I think that's uh, aimed at Washington, as Hussein Ibish says, you know, aimed at America's allies in Washington and letting, you know, ensuring that this is a public. Normally, you'd have this discussion with with the U.S. Secretary of State and you wouldn't uh, issue a, a video in English about it. But I think that um, Benjamin Netanyahu wants to force the American administration wants to force Washington to take some action on this step, or at least to let it be known that he's following them on it. So, Iris, uh, uh, as it stands, is Netanyahu approaching all of this from a position of weakness or strength? I ask because he's feeling pressure from several points. Yeah, let's just start with the people. Um, the people are protesting in greater numbers. These are not yet the numbers that we saw during the judicial over, overhaul, overthrow protests earlier, but it's, you know, it's harder to demonstrate against a government that is fighting a war uh, on, on your behalf. And, you know, the people are very aware that it's their sons that are fighting in that war. Having said that, there were thousands outside the parliament last night. There are hundreds, if not, I don't know if the crowd is as big, but there are definitely hundreds tonight. Uh, one of the reasons the crowd might not be as big is because there was a lot of violence from law enforcement, actually, if you ask me, to assess what was going on. It was relatively quiet when they were outside the parliament, when the crowd started walking down to Benjamin Netanyahu's house. Uh, then there was a lot of violence. And for the second time, I think in two weeks, a doctor who was treating people who were wounded in the violence at the protest, she, uh, that doctor was wounded herself. She actually got um, hit in the eye by water cannon. So, you know, it's you're seeing something ratcheting up here from the street. Just today, you know, there are smaller, almost you'd call them guerrilla actions, roads are blocked uh, with the sign saying, you know, hostages now, so end the war, uh, elections now. We need a new government. That's the theme of the two crowds who meet together and are almost fused now, or at least have both interests. And today, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't see many of these crowds, but he was at a commemoration for um, a right wing commemoration that's held. He was there and there weren't many people, about 100, but they were noisy. And he heard them inside the commemoration and said, the most important thing is no to civil war. And I hope those people outside can hear too. So you can see the pressure is mounting.
Iris Makla, many thanks for joining us for that live update uh, here in the France 24 uh, debate. Uh, Jeremy Isakarov, um, you're also in, in Jerusalem. What, what is the mood changing where you are? Uh, not only in Jerusalem, but I was also in the demonstration yesterday evening. Uh, the, there is a very vibrant uh, demonstrations going on. There's a great deal of, uh, I'd say, public opinion that militates towards ending this war, getting our hostages back and beginning to think of the after, day after a political solution of what's going on in, uh, in Gaza. And I see the statement that uh, Netanyahu made to mainly addressing internal Israeli politics uh, mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. that he's being pressured by America and he's standing firm. Um, you know, the whole Churchillian slogan. But I don't think this is uh, something that, uh, you know, in any way there's been immense, very significant American support over the last months for Israel in terms of supplies, uh, military supplies, advanced weaponry. Um, and I don't, I would suggest to all of our, uh, the other people who've said this, this is not gonna be, if we have to address the security situation in Lebanon, we will have the ability to do it. And I would not underestimate our ability in that regard. But again, I think that one of the key factors is to bring stability, no one's looking for an easy victory. We need to get stability and get back onto a political track in which we begin to address the situation in the south, the situation in the north, and also, more importantly, the broader Iranian threat, which is still very, very significant and growing in its gravity. And just briefly, just to be very clear, uh, Jeremy, why, why were you uh, demonstrating? Because I believe that the war should come to an end. I think the highest priorities to bring the hostages home now. So far, we can do the maths. Uh, Israel has been able, through military means, to rescue seven hostages alive, and through negotiations and breaks in the fighting, been able to bring back 131 hostages. I believe it is absolutely imperative to bring the hostages all back now, immediately, to, and even if we have to, at this point, end the war in Gaza and begin a different approach to how we're going to address the day after in uh, in Gaza and also, for that matter, in the West Bank. And I have, my estimation is that that would have a calming effect at least on Lebanon uh, and would avoid at this time an escalation. But that's, yep. that's just my personal opinion. Netanyahu claims he wasn't in the loop when the army announced uh, tactical pauses uh, in Gaza, writing in Israeli broadsheet newspaper Haaretz, uh, columnist Anshel Pfeiffer saying the prime minister can't forever point the finger at uh, top brass in the military and insist on photo ops with the grunts, as he put it. It's proving impossible to keep extolling the soldiers while imposing upon them longer conscription periods and even more months of reserve duty. But Netanyahu can't avoid it. He has to keep his Haredi partners on board. Those are uh, uh, the uh, religious ones who have those exemptions from serving uh, in the military. Nomi Bar Yaakov, um, seven months ago, there were all these predictions that Netanyahu was about uh, to be ousted. Hasn't been the case. Um, he uh, seems that he's got his coalition. He's got his 64 votes in the Knesset. 61 is the magic number. And uh, he, can, he can just keep going. At this point, is his biggest threat at home or is it abroad? I think his biggest threat is at home. And um, you have mentioned the Haredi um, um, coalition, the partners that he has. And there is a very serious debate about um, the conscription of Haredis and a law that is continuously being amended and passed. Um, I think the Supreme Court will um, ensure that the law does not pass. And his government may fall on that. I mean, I think that the government will fall from within, not from the, the pressure will come from within, but no one knows exactly when that will happen. It could be a while, Hussein Abish. You get the sense uh, when he was in that clip we heard that uh, uh, Netanyahu was, uh, again, uh, almost uh, uh, talking uh, over the, uh, the, the current administration in Washington to the American right. people. I heard well, there's an election soon where you are. Yeah, he was talking to Congress, really. He was talking to Congress, to Republicans and Democrats in the Senate and the House, saying, look, you know, pressure the White House to lift what, 
in effect, is a, a restriction on um, re-upping Israel with certain munitions uh, that they have been expending in the Gaza war. And it was mainly, the proximate cause for it was the uh, U.S. insistence that Israel did not attack Rafah the way that they had attacked Khan Yunus, um, given the number of uh, Palestinians who had been forced into that vicinity. And uh, the Israelis haven't done that. So, uh, you know, it's sort of 50-50. We'll see what happens. But, you know, the good news for Netanyahu for Hochstein, for Jeremy Tsakarov, uh, my friend here, and, and everybody else who is worried about uh, Hezbollah, is that it is very clear. One of the few things that I'm absolutely certain about in the contemporary Middle East is that Hezbollah, with the strong support of their Iranian patrons and, and bosses, uh, does not want a war under current circumstances. The purpose of Hezbollah in the Iranian alliance of which it is effectively the Arab leader, uh, is to be a deterrent against and a strategic response to an Israeli or American assault on the Iranian homeland, specifically on their nuclear facilities. It is not uh, interested under current circumstances in a war with Israel. So there is no immediate urgency. I understand that Israelis look at all their borders differently after October 7th. I, I do get that. I mean, no one's, you know, uh, dismissing it. On the other hand, uh, Hezbollah was created because of the uh, Israeli invasion uh, in 1982 and the subsequent occupation. So it does sound a little bit like, you know, the orphan throwing himself on the mercy of the court, uh, uh, you know, for killing his parents because he's an orphan. Israel really sort of has played a major role in uh, Hezbollah's creation and development through its own act actions. Um, but there is no immediate threat of a, of a major war coming from uh, the Lebanese side of this border, from the south. It is all coming from the Israeli side, in my view. The, uh, Hezbollah has been reactive, and they've been very measured, and in word and deed, they've made it extremely clear that right now they don't want a war with Israel. And so it is entirely avoidable. Uh, I have to, uh, if I could just come in here, you know, I think it's really, you know, really being very one-sided to talking about, you know, Hezbollah's an Israeli invention. We wanted... I didn't uh, say that. An, uh, an extreme... No, that's exactly what you said. An extremist... No, I said it, it was... Terrorist organization. Please, I didn't interrupt you. An right. extremist Shiite terrorist organization undermining Lebanese sovereignty. Lebanon hardly existed there as a sovereign state. And once... All of a sudden, Nasrallah gets up in the morning and decides that he wants to kidnap a couple of soldiers like he did in 2006 and precipitate a war, then this is all Israel's fault. No, it's very rich yeah. for an Israeli to talk no, about no, Lebanese no, 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 sovereignty. No. You know, again, I mean, oh, that's, uh, sorry, but we can go down that oh, route. It's also funny Hold to on. hear Mr. Hezbollah Mr. was responsible for Israeli worried. sovereignty. No doubt about it. Look, you can't compare now in 2006. In 2006, Nasrallah's action was reckless, and he cre he created that war, and he even had to apologize for it. And everything you said about Hezbollah is true. It's also true that without Israel's aggressions in Lebanon, it probably wouldn't exist. So both things are true at the same time. Maybe, Maybe, but things have changed in 2006. Hezbollah is uh, yeah, the, let, 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 let's let's fast power. forward to the present because we're running short on time. Uh, Nadim Huri, um, the uh, right now, when you look at what's going on with Lebanon, certainly in April, uh, those Iranian missiles uh, that that were uh, that that were targeting directly Israel. That was a first, and it was a startling moment. What will be the long-term consequences, the other shoe going to drop later. Yeah, but maybe we should remember as well, I mean, these rockets came after Israel attacked Iranian sovereign territory in Syria. So who's who's poking in a way at this point? And this is not because I have any sort of uh, love loss for the Iranian regime or anything, but Israel is sort of poking, trying to score points. And it, Iran and Hezbollah have made it clear, very clear that they are going to respond, right? So, and, and so you can see today with releasing the footage of Haifa. So Nasrallah is sending a message, Hezbollah is sending a message, watch out, if you want to elevate, we can also hurt you. You know, so what is the other shoe? I fully agree with Hussein. Hezbollah does not want a war. Uh, Hezbollah has made it very clear. They've actually been very consistent. And actually, if you look at uh, Nasrallah's discourse, it's very clear. 
for them, uh, the border will go quiet the day there's a ceasefire in Gaza. They've shown it in the past that they can actually uh, stick to this. They've shown in the past that actually they can be an actor when it came to accepting the maritime border deal with Israel. Uh, I actually think they can also be an actor, and everyone seems to agree that we can probably have a land border deal uh, and end this issue if there is a ceasefire. The problem mm -hmm. is, you know, what my concern is, is, is Netanyahu trying to, to even, actually I'm sorry, score? is that true even if you have say, elections coming up in Iran, and yeah. uh, there's, yeah. there's Look, brinkmanship, I think, I think, I think and, Hezbollah and the fact has that, a lot that, of that the Iranians, for, for domestic reasons, decide to return yeah. up the volume a bit. Yeah, well, why, you know, I mean, the bigger deal, frankly, was the uh, maritime border deal, because yeah. that had to do with gas, with money, as opposed right. to, frankly, the land deal, which is really a few square kilometers here and there, and Hezbollah signed off on it. So I actually think, I agree with Hussein's analysis. Again, has what was the border like since the end of the 2006 war between uh, Israel and Lebanon? Actually, very quiet. So you know, it, this is uh, not you know. There's actually a certain rationality to Hezbollah, and they're actually showing it day day to day. So I think the best thing is, frankly, if we can get to kind of fast forward. The best thing to do is to kind of go back to a discussion about what does a real implemented 1701, because yes, Hezbollah didn't implement 1701, but frankly, neither did Israel, right? Oh, so, I mean, what would, what would a better implemented 1701 look like? But the other question is, is there a state building project for Lebanon today? You know, I mean, everyone talks about 15,000 Lebanese troops that are supposed to deploy. Who's gonna pay their salaries when the country is completely bankrupt? So if we can get to these issues, that will give stability. That would allow the Lebanese to go back to southern Lebanon and the Israelis to go back to, to northern Israel. But Israel is not going to have, I mean, I think where Hezbollah has been successful is to tell the Israelis, you're not going to have a quiet border while we live under fear or where you are free to do whatever you want in Gaza. No, no. Are the Israelis willing to, to hear this, to live with it? I'm not sure, but I think this is the new yeah. equilibrium we are at today. And the cost of testing this is going to be utter destruction, yes, for Lebanon, but frankly, I think as well for Israel. And it will actually risk there's, a real no, regional. Nomi Bar Yaakov, let me ask you. Let me ask you on this, Nomi Bar Yaakov. The uh, the uh, we we talked earlier uh, about uh, the uh, differences between the Israeli Prime Minister and the military top brass over Gaza. Uh, are they on the same page when it comes to Lebanon? No, I'm not sure, and I, I think that the only solution to Lebanon is um, um, an implementation of 1701, which is the Security Council resolution that Hussein and Nadim have discussed the violations um, on the Israeli side. But the withdrawal from um, the withdrawal of Hezbollah north of the Litani is a key element here, and Israel is keen to return the over 100,000 evacuees from the north. So I think it's not so much Netanyahu versus the military. It's about, I think both Netanyahu and the military um, will agree to a diplomatic solution if they could, if either Macron or the US or both could convince them that the border will be secure. And that's what it's about. They do not have confidence in UNIFIL, the current uh, United Nations peacekeeping force um, that um, is supposed to keep uh, the peace in that area. And there has to be a reinforced uh, force. There have to be international guarantees. And I think in that case, to answer your question, Francois, both Netanyahu and the military and the very extreme right-wing Israeli government will have no choice but to say no mm -hmm. war. I also agree with Hussein. Some elements in the Israeli government do want war. So I think we have to make that clear for the record. They think that the only way to um, secure the border is mm -hmm. through military action. I bitterly disagree. I think military action will be a disaster in Lebanon. And I just think that a diplomatic push uh, for the implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 with a reinforced peacekeeping force and international guarantees yeah. uh, is what's necessary. Before we Can go, I, I want to... Everything I, that Naomi ahead, and Nadim have said is exactly right, but there is an additional complication, which is that Hezbollah uses um, the border area, the dispute over Shaba farms and parts of uh, small areas of southern Lebanon uh, or, or in Israel's mind, Syria, these little territories um, that uh, most Lebanese agree are still occupied by Israel, they use that 
and the tensions at the border to justify maintaining the, the only major militia in Lebanon. And so that is, is sort of the, the key to their political power. And it's going to be a complication that will have to be overcome because for them, it's the rationalization for a lot of what they do that is uh, not available to other Lebanese parties. And uh, it's going to be a complicated thing to get them to uh, agree uh, to anything that compromises their ability to use uh, the, 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 these areas and tensions at the Israeli border, uh, you know, for uh, to justify their their political, um, you know, sort of agenda and their militia, their main, maintenance of a private army and therefore a private foreign and, and uh, defense policy uh, in Lebanon, and that's a tall order. It's taller. Before we go, uh, it's it's um, uh, here we are talking about uh, uh, whether or not there's going to be a spillover effect of uh, the war in Gaza on the wider uh, Middle East. Well, this is all happening. We're, we're sitting in Paris and there is a spillover effect of what's happening in the Middle East here. We have snap elections coming up. The left formed a, an alliance. The leader of the largest party in that coalition a red rag to a bull for many, what was Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who centered much of his recent European elections campaign on support uh, for the Palestinian cause. Uh, Nadim Houri, are, are, are you surprised at uh, how, how much the, 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 the Middle East has been a factor, it seems, in domestic politics in this country? Uh, no, I haven't. I mean, I, I think that part of the world always tends to explode on the international scene. But I also think what we've seen uh, since October 7th is somehow Palestine and the cause of Palestine has crystallized so many currents for younger generations, pushing on anti-racism, anti-colonialism, social justice. Um, and I think in a way it has outgrown uh, the region. So yes, there is a sort of part of the old sort of politics in Mélenchon's uh, speeches, but actually it's intersecting with the younger generation, similar to what we're seeing on campuses and universities in the US, uh, that is actually pushing back on a broader narrative. But that's frankly, that's always been the issue with uh, Israel-Palestine be it on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, be it in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. You know, everyone remembers key moments within this conflict because they're so international, because the diasporized politics, be it on the Israeli Jewish side, be it on the Palestinian side, be it on the, for the Arabs, uh, be it on, on all the politics. And, and honestly, as well, I mean, given the, uh, the genocide that is ongoing in Gaza, that's actually being televised, of course, people feel very strongly about it at a, at a moment where the younger generation, be it on TikTok, be it on social media, are increasingly pushing back on certain narratives uh, Fra France, from their parents. France is home to uh, Europe's largest Muslim, but also Europe largest Jewish community. Uh, there's 88-year-old uh, Nazi hunter Serge Klarsfeld in an interview with K French cable news channel LCI last weekend saying he would prefer to vote for a far-right candidate if, he, if that was the only choice uh, available opposite a candidate from Mélenchon's party in the uh, second round. It's a two-round system here in France. He added that Marine Le Pen's party had evolved. Nomi Bar Yaakov, are views to the Middle East changing? Um, I think views to the Middle East are becoming uh, sharper uh, in light of uh, 7th of October and the war uh, in Gaza. I'm not sure if they're changing, but I think that um, alliances are getting um, yeah, stronger. I think a lot of um, many Jews are disillusioned with what Israel, um, with the nature um, and scope of the war in Gaza. And like Jeremy, many, many, many Jews, and I think the vast majority in the world, and I think also in the Israeli public, are calling for an end to the war now. And I think that's, um, so the answer to your question is yes, I think views are changing. And I think it's uh, to a large extent because of the way that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been leading uh, the country into an abyss. And of course, there I, are. Uh, to, uh, could I just say something here? Very um, briefly, because we're out of time. 
Okay, well, you know, you didn't give me the time to, to reply to Mr. Hori, and I think it's appropriate that I should. You know, this is not just about, you know, what happens in Gaza. It's also about what happened in Israel and its impact on, on Israelis being killed, raped and murdered. And I, fortunately, I don't really hear much of a regret in his voice regarding those events. And I think it would be... Where are you saying this? Where did you hear this? So I some, condemned and I've actually called for the release of hostages well, we many, many times publicly. So it's, it's too easy to kind of use that card as somehow we're lesser humans. I didn't okay. actually start by saying I didn't hear in your voice sorrow for the Palestinians and the Lebanese who have been killed. That's fine. But, you know, what I said is what I said. And I think That's it fine. would be nice for you. I will, so unfortunately, I wish we had another hour. We're, we're running short on time. Uh, Ambassador Isaacaroff, I want to thank you so much for being with us uh, from Jerusalem. I want to thank Nomi Baryakov. Uh, in London, Hussein Ibish in Washington, Nadim Khoury, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 Today.